I'm Tom Ospew, Provost Vice President of Academic Affairs at Green Mountain College. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2017 Thomas L. Benson Lecture. Once again, the community is gathered on or around Earth Day, as we have for many years, to hear a visionary speaker who has helped them to lead the way to a more just and sustainable future. Lest we forget the origins of this event, let me introduce you virtually to Dr. Thomas L. Benson, for whom this lecture series was named, and to whom this college owes much. Tom Benson is President Emeritus of Green Mountain College, and it was under his leadership between 1994 and 2002 that Green Mountain College transformed itself into first an environmental liberal arts college and then a college first in sustainability. Tom was an inspired and inspiring leader who worked passionately to build a robust educational environment dedicated to the profound proposition that we could have an education that illuminates for students their situated existence in complex economic, social, and environmental systems and gives them the tools to understand those systems and the agency to engage them. Dr. Benson continues to consult on international education initiatives, including projects in East Africa, East Asia and Africa. He is the founder and executive director of the World Leadership Corps. He is the co-founder and former chair of the Asia Network, founder of the Africa Network, He's also the former chair of the board of Japan ICU and served as the founder and co-director of the World Education Institute in the James Martin School for the 21st Century. Tom would have been delighted to be here today to hear our distinguished guest. I had a long conversation with him last week. He would be thrilled for the opportunity to spend time with Dr. Glaude. But he did have a scheduling conflict. He's actually being honored at Cornell uh, tonight and sends his regrets. Dr. Claude joins an August list of alumni of the Thomas Benson Lecture Series, including Dan Fagan, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Tom's River, A Story of Science and Salvation, Jonathan Lash, President of Hampshire College, former President of the World Resource Institute, and Chair of President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development, Alan Goldberg, Professor of Toxicology, Founding Director and Chairman of the Board of the Johns Hopkins Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. James Speth, Professor of Vermont Law School, co-founder of the New Economy Law Center, co-founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council, Chairman of the U.S. Council of Environmental Quality in the Carter Administration. Rick Bass, acclaimed author and environmental activist. Captain Alan Beam, an aeronautical engineer, naval aviator, astronaut, he was the Apollo 12 lunar module pilot, who devoted his time after retiring from NASA to paint the Earth, literally, to make paintings of the Earth and the moon and space, so the rest of us could better appreciate their beauty and importance. And Dr. Carlos Sanchez, a prominent research veterinarian. The list of distinguished speakers tells a story of Green Mountain's commitment to engaging as a community with the complex issues and systems that help make this an amazing planet and also the set of challenges that demand so much from us. I recently read Dr. Claude's book, Democracy in Black, A Race Still Enslaves the American Soul. It's a powerful book, provocative and insightful. I have no doubt that Professor Claude will engage, inspire, and challenge us tonight. I would now like to bring up my friend and colleague, Professor Steve Fessmeyer, to give Dr. Glaude the rich introduction he so very much deserves. Steve? assassinated three miles from my childhood home in Memphis, Tennessee. I was six months old. My older brother happened to be sick, very sick, that night. 
My father rushed him through the riot zone to, to nearby Methodist Hospital. I was raised in a climate of racist white fear, always on the so-called right side of literal tracks that divided and still divides races and classes throughout America. Genuine transformation of deeply entrenched American racial habits and cultural practices still appears a distant and perhaps receding hope. Yet change is always afoot, and history is filled with the revolutionary effects of shared reflection and action. Of course, the eventual consequences of democratic social action cannot be entirely predicted and predetermined. We see the significance of great movements in hindsight, rarely at their source. Standing by the Grand Canyon, we appreciate the importance of that little trickling stream high in the Colorado Rockies. What change needs is direction, a channel for energies, and the United States is greatly in need of durable change at the Grand Canyon scale. During last week's Earth Day celebrations, we at Green Mountain College understood that our civilization is far closer to that narrow mountain stream than to the wide canyon. We understood that Earth Day is a window through which to imagine a sustainable society that's a long ways off. But think back to January, to Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. That holiday is celebrated in the American mainstream as our near arrival at the canyon of freedom and justice. If only we'll tinker with the system a bit and push a little harder in the direction of our frozen and sacrosanct American ideals, the dominant story runs, we'll arrive soon. If you're among the one-third to one-half of Green Mountain College students, one-fourth of our faculty, and most of our administration reading Dr. Glaude's Democracy in Black this semester, your bullshit meter just went off. <laughs> Tonight, we'll all be treated to a chance to fine-tune that meter. Eddie S. Law, Jr. is the chair of the Department of African American Studies and the William S. Todd Professor of Religion and African American Studies at Princeton University. In 2009, Dr. Law was awarded Princeton's President's Award for Distinguished Teaching. His research interests include American pragmatism, specifically the work of John Dewey, and African American religious history and its place in American public life. Dr. Glaude is one of the most important intellectuals in the United States today, helping us to reimagine the unfinished project of American democracy. With his call for a full blown democratic awakening, his, he offers a critical, insightful, and prophetic view on the problems currently facing black America as well as the nation at large. He is the author of Exodus, Religion, Race, and Nation in Early 19th Century Black America, winner of the William Sanders Scarborough Book Prize, and A Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America, and African American Religion, a very short introduction. He is the editor of Is It Nation Time, Contemporary Essays on Black Power and Black Nationalism, and co-editor with Cornell West of African American Religious Thought and Anthology. In Cornell West's words, Quote, Dr. Eddie Glaude is the towering intellectual of his generation. There is simply no one else like him emerging on the, American, on the intellectual scene. Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul is his latest book. There will be an opportunity for a signing uh, of that book right over here after the lecture tonight. So if you brought your copy and you'd like to hang out, Dr. Glaude will uh, be over here after the talk. As many in our community are already well aware, this book is a provocative account of the current state of race in the United States. Tonight, Dr. Gulag's topic is An Uncommon Faith, W.E.B. Du Bois and African American Religion. Please join me in giving a warm Green Mountain College and Vermont welcome to Dr. Eddie Gulag.
Provost Don, thank you for making this possible. All the folks who have uh, gone, done the work uh, to, to get me here. Such a beautiful campus. And you step off, uh, you step onto the campus, and something happens with the air. <laughs> it's just so much more crisp. <laughs> from New Jersey. <laughs> um, you know, it, I've been traveling around the country talking about democracy in black for two years now, trying desperately to um, uh, spur a conversation about where we are. Uh, it's been difficult, it's been a challenge. But I must admit today, over supper and prior to, uh, I had a wonderful conversation with some of the colleagues, pushing me, asking me great questions. Uh, I tend to be long-winded, um, but it's a testament to what is happening here at Green Mountain. So I want to thank all of the, the students who joined me earlier. I'm not going to talk about democracy black at all. Um, we can talk about it during the Q&A if, if you have questions. But I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to put on a different hat. Was that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to jump right into it. American pragmatists have often found themselves grappling with the subject, and it is sometimes a vexing subject, of religion. They contend with its truth claims as well as account for the experiences with empathy or skepticism that often fall under the category's description, and we do so in the light of the commitments, in light of commitments that define philosophical pragmatism. William James powerfully describes the pragmatist as one who, quote, turns away from abstraction and insufficiency, from verbal solutions, from bad operary reasons, from fixed principles, closed systems, and pretended absolutes and origins. He turns towards concreteness and adequacy towards facts towards action and towards power. It means the open air and possibilities of nature as against dogma, artificiality, and the pretense of finality. The good pragmatist then encourages a view of philosophy where the neat conundrums of our professional practice give way to a certain kind of responsibility in our intellectual lives. That's why I wrote the Bible in Black yes. Where we take the tools of our training and work to offer insight, however limited, into specific conditions of value and into specific consequences of ideas. So on this view, philosophy becomes, as John Dewey argued, quote, criticism of the influential beliefs that underlie culture, criticism which traces the beliefs to their generating conditions as far as may be, which tracks them to their results, which considers the mutual compatibility of the elements of the total structure of beliefs. Such an examination, Dewey says, terminates whether so intended or not, in the projection of them into a new perspective, into a new perspective which leads to new possibilities. Pragmatism places an accent on an open, malleable, and pluralistic universe, a view in which change is a central feature of our living, demanding of us variety, imagination, and experimentation in practical matters. Richard Rorty, the late Richard Rorty, might have given us the most radical rendering of this sensibility, quote, the sense that there is nothing deep down inside us except what we have put there ourselves. No criterion that we have not created in the course of creating a practice, no standard of rationality that is not an appeal to such a criterion, no rigorous argumentation that is not obedience to our own conventions. No wonder the subject of religion can be so vexing for we practiced. Oh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> In my own work, I've tried to think pragmatically about African American religion. For example, I've always had an ambivalent relation to John Dewey's A Common Faith. Not because I disagree with the argument of the book. In fact, by most accounts, I would be considered what they call a pragmatic religious naturalist in the Dewey and Bain. I find his separation of the religious from the supernatural compelling, and I'm more than convinced that the religious quality of experience, that is, the fundamental reordering of the will, evidenced in our adjustment to some particular experience, 
rooted in the creative workings of the imagination, that this can be had apart from religions of any sort. I remember shouting with a loud yes when I first read these words from Dewey's A Common Faith. They, theists and their kin, quote, will have to ask as far as, far as they nominally believe in the need for radical social change, whether what they accomplish when they point with one hand to the seriousness of present evils is not undone when the other hand points away from man and nature from their remedy, quote. Perhaps it was my adolescent rebellion against my indebtedness to quite out less. With Dewey, our salvation or damnation remains always in our hands. It is our responsibility, our cross to bear, so to speak. And we take it up with the idea that we are a part of a communion of fellows with passionate commitments that reach back to a distant past and extends forward to generations to come. As he writes, quote, ours is the responsibility of conserving, transmitting, rectifying, and expanding the heritage of values we have received that those who come after us may receive it more solid and secure, may more widely accessible and more generally shared than we have received This is Dewey's riff, riff on Santiago's idea of natural pride. His, and by extension mine, is a practical faith in ideal ends, a practical faith in ideal ends, a faith that lights up our imagination and convicts us to act in pursuit of those ends. But my ambivalence with a common faith rests in my sense, and it is a deeply felt and personal sense, that religious impulses often reside in the need for consolation. That sense of helplessness in the face of uncertainty and loss. And here, passionate, critical intelligence only takes us so far. I have a footnote here to reference Dewey's, the death of Dewey's sons. Morris and Gordon, that he never mentions them. We find nothing in Dewey's corpus akin to Emerson's grappling with the death of Waldo or Du Bois's struggle with the death of his own son, Burkhardt. I need to think more carefully about the silences here. But hovering over all of this, obviously, is William James. He's in the background, as well as the particular tradition out of which I come. I find James compelling not so much because I find his talk of religious experience convincing. I do not. I don't hold, for example, the view that religious experience singles out anything unique in experience, but, but the place from which James takes up the question. This sense that all cannot end in shipwreck. This idea that for some, this religion of the sick soul, as he writes, the real core, the real core, quote, of the religious problem is this cry for help. Help. This speaks to me profoundly because of my own intimate relationship with loss. Three uncles committed suicide. I remember my first memory, massive car accident, four family members all killed at once. Because of my own intimate relationship with loss, and because of the fact that it is a dis disconcerting fact indeed that the people to whom I belong have had to grapple with loss as a fundamental feature of our soldier in this nation. I'm about to preach. <laughs> I grew up Catholic on the coast of Mississippi. It is an old black Catholic community, one rooted in the Josephite tradition. The Josephite Society of the Sacred Heart was formed in 1871. Its mission was to serve black freedmen and women in the aftermath of the Civil War, quote, through the proclamation of the gospel and personal witness, end quote. They established a presence on the coast of Mississippi in 1907 with the founding of St. Peter the Apostle Parish in Pascagoula. My father's family belonged to this church. Generations of gods were christened here, took their first communion, and received confirmation. We were part of roughly 1.2 million black Catholics in the United States. Now, the Catholic church I grew up in was radically different from my grandmother's. Mine bore the effects of Vatican II and conducted its ministry in a post-Jim Crow world, although the white Catholic church still exists across town. 
No more liturgies in, in, in Latin. Our priests often wore tente cloth, and we had a gospel choir. My mother, along with her friends in the choir, would sing, soon and very soon we're going to see the king. They would rhythmically swing back and forth and give God the glory and praise song while the members of St. Peter sat quietly with a slight rock of the shoulders and a reserved pat of the foot that kept time. It was a Catholic church after all. <laughs> Our church choir was invited, was even invited to a local gospel festival. Choirs from churches all over our little town gathered to sing and worship. And this was my first experience of black Pentecostal and black Baptist traditions. I sat at the far left corner of the pew in a stereotypically small southern church house. The seat was only available because we arrived early. The church was packed. It was, it was hot. Mississippi heat has a way of sticking to you. It slows the pace of life but adds a level of intensity to any activity. So the room was thick with sweat and anticipation. An older, heavyset woman sat next to me. She wore a bright floral print dress, dress and her hair was freshly, freshly pressed. I could smell the effects of the hot comb. Beads of sweat, those of you who don't know what a hot comb is, I'll explain it later. <laughs> she wore a bright floral print dress and her hair was freshly pressed. Beads of sweat trickled down the side of her face. Go down, get me, she said to me. I moved as far as I could, but there wasn't much room. As the preacher began to say a few words before offering prayer, I sat in amazement. He was a poet. And unlike Father Vale, who was so mind-numbingly deliberate in everything he said, <laughs> this man made the gospel come alive. The preacher started to pray. No one stood. Everyone bowed his heads or her head, his or her heads. I heard something strange and incredible. He started slowly. The congregation murmured in agreement. His pace quickened. His words began to take on a rhythm. And the folk began to shout back, Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. The woman next to me rocked back and forth, bumping against me as she called back to the preacher. I had never heard or seen anything like this. St. Peter's was quiet. Our priest spoke in hushed tones. But this preacher prayed more, with more intensity. As he ended, everyone seemed on edge, and emotions threatened to burst open the church. Then the unique sound of the Hammond B3 organ took over, and one of the choirs marched in, clapping their hands and singing at the top of their lungs. This was true theater, and the music took my breath away. Women with the phrasing of Sarah Vaughan and the sound of Bessie Smith sang on Calvary. Men who could give B.B. King and Sam Cooke a run for their money crooned, I don't feel no ways tired. The small church rocked as choirs and the congregation shouted and praised. I sat with my mouth open when suddenly the woman next to me began to speak in a loud whisper. She started to shake, waving her right hand in the air, saying, thank you. I sat next to her in horror <laughs> as she fell back in the pew and on to me. <laughs> she had caught the spirit. And my mother was looking at me from the, from the choir stand like this. <laughs> This is what W.B. Du Bois, the great scholar, the Harvard trained scholar, and author of the Souls of the Black Folk, this is what he described or referred to as the Dipethian madness, a demonic possession that lent terrible reality to song and word. And like Du Bois, such an experience was completely foreign to me and yet wholly familiar. Here in this little house of worship on the coast of Mississippi, I experienced what the boys described in the souls of black folk as the three things that characterized the religion of the slave. The preaching, the music, and the frenzy. For him, each accounts for the distinctiveness of black religious life and sets the stage for the importance of the Negro church, as he called it, as a civic institution in African American life, more generally. The preacher is the paradigmatic figure of, for black leaders. 
The music offers a glimpse into the blue-soaked soul of a people. It is their plaintive cry under the storm and stress of American life. The frenzy, the shouting, the getting happy for Du Bois captures the delicate balance between joy and terror that shadows black life in the United States. It is the eruption of the spirit in ordinary time that assures the presence of God amid the absurdity of white supremacy. All three features are powerfully expressed in what Du Bois called the Negro Church. This institution stood at the epicenter of black life. Voluntary associations that addressed the social and economic needs of the community formed within its walls. Church buildings provided the physical space for the education of children. My own beloved Morehouse was found in the basement of the church. They also offered space for political debate and organizing. Here, one acquired a sense of the religious worldview of a captured people for the quote-unquote Negro church under the brutal weight of slavery and Jim Crow gave its members and its community, thank like, bless you, community languages to imagine themselves apart from the dehumanizing practices of white supremacy. One hears this in the plaintive sound of slave spirituals. Canaan land is the land for me and let God's saints come in. There was a big wicked man who kept the children in Egypt land. Canaan land is the land for me. And let God's saints come in. Or in the moving words of a modern gospel song, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Each song envisions the possibility of a brighter future predicated on an abiding faith in God, an insight gained in communion and worship with others. But for my purposes tonight, to reduce Du Bois' account of African American religion, to his sociological description of the preacher, the music, and the frenzy, to black churches, is to miss something significant in what I believe he's trying to do. Or better, put what he's trying to commend. We typically think about Du Bois' view of religion in light of this description of the faith of the fathers in his classic 1903, Souls of Black Folk. In that essay, Du Bois puts forward that description, as we just talked about, of a dynamic social institution confronted with the enormous transformations wrought by increasing urbanization and modernization, as well as the sedimentation of the new racial regime of Jim Crow. There were a lot of words in that sentence that ended with T-I-O-N. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Y'all all right? <laughs> The boys asked, how might this important institution, one that predated the black family, respond to the shifting material conditions of black life? Here, Du Bois locates the idea, his famous idea, of double consciousness introduced in the first chapter of Souls, right, into the religious life of black America. Folks caught in double aims, as he writes. So much can be said here, but I'm less interested in this institutional dimension of black religious life, although I understand fully the need to keep track of how religious institutions shape our life more. Perhaps we've given them too much attention to Du Bois' sociological treatment of the Negro Church. His attention to the preacher, the music, the frenzy, his account of its role in policing morality within black communities and the like, and not enough attention to the religious ideal he commends at the end of that chapter of the faith of the Bible. Listen, Du Bois ends with a reference to what he calls a new religious ideal. I'm going to quote him here. The back of this still grew silently the deep religious feeling of the real Negro heart. The story of unguided might of powerful human souls who have lost the guiding star of the past and are seeking in the great night a new religious ideal. Someday the awakening will come, he writes, when the pent up vigor of 10 million souls shall sweep irresistibly toward the goal out of the valley of the shadow of death where all that makes life worth living. Liberty, justice, and right is marked for white people. It is an admittedly vague gesture that lends itself to misreading. I have on occasion read this passage as a reinscription of a kind of essentialist, even orientalist idea of the inherent religiosity of black folk. But I now believe Du Bois is doing something quite different here. Free from the historical encumbrances of the past, he suggests African Americans are now released to imagine anew, and to do so in such a way that gives depth and significance to the question that William James grappled with in his classic 1895 essay, Is Life Worth Living? 
For Du Bois, this question is not taken up in the abstract. He struggles with it in the context of a world darkened by the realities of white supremacy. What follows is the essay. What follows the essay of the faith, faith of the fathers is the chapter of the passing of the firstborn. The contours of the new religious ideal Du Bois commends are given shape not in the context of grappling with religious disease, but with confronting his baby in the coffin. His child dies because a white hospital is not treated. The last paragraph of the faith of our fathers then opens up his reflections on the death of his son, a formal elegy that offers little to no consolation for him or the reader. And it is here that I want to linger a bit to reflect on what it might mean to foreground this essay as his account of a religious sensibility instead of attention to the preaching, the music, and the friends. My pragmatism. What I hope to show, and again, this is all preliminary, is that Du Bois provides us with a view that can be called a chastened pragmatic religious naturalist. And according to my former student, Jonathan Cobb, pragmatic religious naturalists subvert traditional religious metaphysics of ultimate truth and foundational beliefs while holding tight to religious stories, moods, symbols, rhetoric, and moral values because they are links to the past, because they are powerful tools and narratives for shaping and envisioning life because they can allow for a type of spirituality that it emphasizes fallibility, fragility, and the power of the human made ties that bind us and make us dependent on each other. So the pragmatic religious naturalist takes seriously religious stories, not because of their veridical, you know, work, but because they connect us, they do work with us. So I want, to, I want to talk about what I call a chastened pragmatic religious naturalism and that the shift in focus from of the faith to the father to of the passing of the firstborn may help us chart a particular mode of religious expression that goes from W.B. Du Bois to Ralph Ellison to Lorraine Hansberry to James Baldwin all the way to Ayanna Mathis and her extraordinary novel, The Twelve Tribes of Adam. If you haven't read this novel, write it down. This chasing view begins with the disturbing realization that the natural world as it is, is in fact arrayed against one's aims and purposes. That the very ground upon which one stands is in fact diseased, distorted, and deformed, not naturally, but by human actions directed towards black bodies. Remember that line in Toni Morrison's Beloved. When Stamp paid, Pulls the, stamp, pulls the scalp of a baby's head out of the water. And Stan Page is trying to grapple with the problem of evil. And he says, my God, what are these people? What are these people? Or well, that moment in Toni Morrison's Beloved where she says that these folk can dirty you so bad they can dirty you on the inside and you don't like yourself. like that young boy on the coast of Mississippi who would go on to be a professor at Princeton who's in class in the fourth grade and he has to tell everybody that he has Indian in it because he don't want them to think he's black. That something takes root on the inside that distorts the formation of character. Yet and still, that world is our ground. The place from which we dare to forge unique selves in communion with others who are similarly situated. This work Effort involves religious stories, narratives that orient us not only to a particular problem, but to the very task of creating selves. As Jonathan Kahn notes, Du Bois deploys religious vocabularies in order to craft a moral and political sensibility attuned to the finite needs of selves and communities struggling against concrete social and political realities. We dream. Religion allows us to freedom dream. Religion allows us to generate the vocabularies to engage in techniques of self-creation. In a, world, in a world in which our bodies are subject to arbitrary uses of violence. Hmm? Y'all all right? Just checking on me. It's hot in here, not just because it's hot in here. <laughs> he does so without appeal to metaphysical foundations. Instead, Du Bois keeps us squarely in what he calls and of our spiritual strivings, the strange experience. That which establishes us, black folk, as the problematic in the United States. He does so not to have us wallow in pessimism or self-pity, 
to slip into a form of sycophancy or hatred. Instead, Du Bois commends his view in light of his own distinctive meliorist vision, namely that the world we inhabit can be saved, that the hell black folk catch can be undone if we only act without guarantee of satisfactory outcomes. If we only act. Here, the subjunctive mood stands as a distinctive feature of what I want to call an uncommon faith, that the as yet is articulated in the face of loss and horror made explicit. That this world doesn't have the last word. That this condition doesn't have the last word. But Kant makes his case for Du Bois' pragmatic religious naturalism, to my, in my view, without much attention given to of the passing of the firstborn. Here I'm going to have a little academic argument with my former student. For him, the essay is an angry, politically engaged Jeremiah on race relations. But I think much more is going on here. Here are three moments in the essay. I only note them and offer brief remarks. Each illustrates a particular feature of what I'm going to call Du Bois' uncommon faith. Meliorism is one. That the world can be saved or it can go to hell depending on our choices, actions, and efforts. It's in our hands, no one else's. I want to emphasize, too, ambiguity and uncertainty. That the open-ended character of experience does not offer clear pathways to achieve desired ends. And lastly, a kind of natural piety, rooted in the commitment to generations to come, a commitment pursued against the headwind, headwinds of loneliness and despair as he ends uh, the book, Cheer the Weary Traveler. Cheer the Weary Traveler. So let me go through this really quickly, because I'm abusing your patience. First, the voice writes, listen to this language, listen to this beautiful. Within the veil, he's talking about his baby, Within the veil was he born, said I, and there within shall he live, a Negro and a Negro's son, holding in that little head, ah, bitterly, the unbowed pride of a hunted race, clinging with that tiny dimpled head, ah, wearily, to a hope not hopeless, but unhopeful, and seeing with those bright, wondering eyes that peer into my soul, a land whose freedom is to us a mockery, and whose liberty a lie. So here Du Bois echoes the, the line at the end of, of the faith of the Father, where all that makes life worth living. Remember, liberty, justice, and right is marked for white people. The context for his son's birth and death is a land shot through with the evil of racism, the value gap, right? And the habits that give it life. Practices that cut short the life possibilities of those on the wrong side of what Du Bois calls the veil. But from the very beginning, the voice provides us with a kind of chastened, meliorous position. Hope still resides here, even in bleak times, even where death seems to be a constant companion. And like Emerson before him, Du Bois insists that we act or experience the world in such a way that it becomes definitive of who we take ourselves to be. We do so in hope and on such claim, quote, to a glory as only we alone in our uncertainty can bring to it. This is practical wisdom, colored a deep shade of blue. So the religious ideal is rooted in a world of action that all too often frustrates our aims and ends. We nevertheless muster the courage to act with little to no guarantee that those actions will secure our desired aims and ends. But we do so because in the end, it is all up to us. The second quote. She, who in simple clearness of vision, Sees beyond the stars, said when he had flown, he will be happy there. He ever loved beautiful things. And I, far more ignorant and blind by the web of my own weaving, set alone binding words and muttering, if still he be, and he be there, and there be a there. Let him be happy in fate. Now what we see here is the boy standing in loss and uncertainty. What Arnold Rampers had described as a, a bitter parody of the Christian elegy is clearly seen in that this last portrait sentence. The boys can find no consolation if still he be. And he be there and there be a there. 
God talk offers little to no comfort. He denies himself access to that comfort, to the comfort that is the primal scene of black Christendom, right? And the question becomes, what does he have available to him to muster the strength to keep on living, to hold off debilitating despair now that his baby is dead? It reminds me of my own mother, when my, uh, my uncle's uh, firstborn thought that some Furniture polish, you remember the old furniture polish that was liquid? Thought that it was a soda and drank it. And they had to put him in the ground. He never forgave his wife. It was unfair. How do you hold off debilitating despair? This takes me to the third moment. Du Bois writes, for what? Listen to this language, listen. Quote, for what forsooth shall a Negro want with pride? And amid the humiliations of 50 million fellows. Why train? Well, speed, my boy. Well, speed, my boy. Before the world had dubbed your ambition insolence, had held your ideals unattainable, and, and to you to cringe and bow, metaphor this nameless void that stops my life and a sea of sorrow for you. End quote. And then the next sentence takes it all. He writes, I will words. So Du Bois rejects the escape. This narrative metaphysical comfort is not his to have. Instead, he desperately reaches for what is possible. So he ascends to the subjunctive mood, echo of Emerson's patience, patience, up again, O oh heart. Du Bois grasps for the possibility that all is not settled. As he writes, not for me, quote, not for me. I shall die in my bonds, but for fresh young souls who have not known the night and awaken to the morning, a morning when men ask of the workman, not is he white, but can he work? When men ask artists, not are they black, but do they know, end quote. But this move is an easy one for it. It requires confronting directly the disconcerting and irrevocable fact that his son is dead. In this darkest of moments, when confronted with the fact of the death of his child, Du Bois does not ponder suicide so far as we know. He finds consolation. Like Thomas Carlyle before him, in transforming, transforming grief into struggle. He finds the courage to stake his life on the possibility that one day the reality of racism will no longer be, and those young souls might be able to simply be. William James argued that such an act was one of religious faith. Such an act was one of religious faith. That belief that possibility exists is religious faith. This is especially, this is especially so when darkness surrounds one, when it seems that hope unborn has died. That's a reference to lift every voice and say, no. Perhaps I can bring this home by way of example. I'm coming home. The internationally acclaimed Ghanaian artist, El Anatsu, A-N-A-T-S-G-I, El Anatsu, known for his amazing sculptures and metal sheets made of discarded bottle caps, created a series of clay pots called the Broken Pots series. Here, Anatsu revealed his predilection for the found object. Fragments are shards of broken pots give depth and form by the trace of his hands. And he insists on the importance of clay, its permanence and transience, its fragility and resilience. As, as one scholar noted, the transfiguration of clay from the state of malleability to one of rigidity invokes natural processes of formation and maturation. Yet the susceptibility of the rigid form of reductive transformation also denotes the absence of finality and the presence of infinite possibility. That's so all you have to do is think about the references to John Jones in Du Bois' Of the Coming of John. For a long time, Du Bois writes, the clay seemed unfit for any kind of molding. Here, Du Bois registers how the context of America denies black people the possibility of existence otherwise. The clay is unfit. Permanence and rigidity are its primary features. But Anatsui helps us see otherwise. The clay pot should be seen as a metaphor for the fragility of existence and the delicate nature of life. The broken pot in his hands comes to represent not a permanent state of brokenness. Not a permanent state of brokenness. It's transformation from one state to another, from the relegated to the trash bin, to that which is beautiful, reflects right, a will, as one scholar says, to overcoming. 
Linked as we may, we nevertheless continue to bend. We are reminded in that moment of Samuel Beckett, try, fail, never mind. Hard, try harder, fail better. <laughs> Even if your baby's in the car. Even if your baby's in the car. Part of what I'm trying to do here is to suggest, right, that we're not beginning from a position of wholeness, but a position of brokenness. That the ground of self-creation, the ground of self-creation is a society that denies you dead dignity and standing, a society predicated upon the value gap, a society in which the value gap bears evidence of self and racial habits and fears that can lead to lynching, that can lead to the organization of spaces that demean and denigrate you. But even in those spaces, even there, in the midst of darkness and precarity, it is a space of value. Did y'all hear me? It is a space of value. One scholar explains, quote, a broken pot may never, may never regain its wholeness in terms of its original form, but at the point of its fracture appears a new objectivity, a new reality, a new entity. And since no form is absolute nor any conditional final, no state is primary. Fate here loses its sting. Life ain't been no crystal stair, as Lex Hughes would say, but we keep climbing. What we find in the Natsui's work is the indelible trace, quote, of that which survives in spite of, end quote. And that trace, marking brokenness and wound as the ground upon which we stand, provides a foundation for the continuous work for excellences, for better selves. Du Bois doesn't leave his baby bomb. He still grieves at the end of the essay. And that essay is followed by death of Alexander Cromwell and of the coming of John, where Du Bois recasts Emerson's secret mock melancholy and Thoreau's quiet desperation in, light, in the light of the brutal realities of race in this country. In the end, his chastened pragmatic religious naturalism keeps, him in view, keeps in view that desperate cry for help which so motivated William James and so motivates me. But he does so in light of actual problems faced, in light of practices that cut short the lives of those who live behind the veil or simply out of sight. This is the power of his religious naturalism, that he gives voice to the as yet while struggling with the devastation of loss. Where that baby can say to Philando Castile, to Diamond Reynolds, as she cries on Facebook, it's okay, mommy, I'm here. But she can find the resources somewhere inside her little body to imagine the not as the as. I believe this sensibility has an enduring presence in African American life. And one can trace it from Du Bois to, to my beloved Jimmy Baldwin, to Tony Morrison, to Ayanna Mathis. I'm coming to a close for real this time. Mathis' first novel, Twelve Tribes in Heaven, stands as a particularly powerful example of this view. Spoiler alert. Hattie has experienced so much loss in her life at the end of the novel, it seems that the generational evil that has so consumed her will now touch her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, Salem. God's grace, we are led to believe, will protect her. And as Salem prepared to join the church, Hattie, the central character, said no. I want to read the passage. The sanctuary was silent. Hattie pulled her granddaughter down the center aisle. She couldn't allow it. She had lost six to the altar. She sent them off to Alabama with nothing but a Bible. And he had become a womanizer and an imposter. By the time she understood the depth of his unhappiness, it had been too late to save him. The twins were dead. She had given Ella back to Georgia. It was too late for Cassie, whom Hattie had also sent away. And it was too late for Hattie, who was a fraud in Christ and had shown sailor the ways of fraudulence. She couldn't bear that the child was already so broken. She was driven to the mercy seat. There was time for Sailor. Hattie didn't know how to save her granddaughter. Here, here we are, 60 years out of Georgia, she thought. A new generation has been born, and there's still the same wounding and the same pain. I can't allow it. Hattie looked around at the disapproving faces of the congregation. Their indignation would pass. Everything passed sooner or later. And if it didn't, 
she would give up the church to this dear comfort of hers, of her old age. She was not too old to weather another sacrifice. Had he put her arm around Salem and pulled her close, she patted her granddaughter's back roughly, unaccustomed as she was, to tenderness. Here, Mathis rewrites the primal scene of African American life. Mama slapping beneath the inner raising of the sun. Baldwin's John on the thrashing floor, him go tell it on the mound. Mathis cuts off the retreat to a kind of religious metaphysical comfort, and instead we are left with our fragile, finite, and in some cases broken selves, working for our children and our children's children to secure the values that we have come to cherish, with a hope not hopeless but unhopeful, found in that awkward moment tenderness, care, and grief, all to you after all. Thank you. I was singing it loud, too. 
Um, but it was something about the beauty of the, the beauty of the, the beauty of mass, the solemnity of the mass. You put me in a you put me in a Catholic service now. I can say the confession of faith immediately. Right? The ritual practice that brought me into communion with others. The, um, the liturgy is so rich and beautiful. And I particularly remember Father Horton, not Father Horton, you know, Father Horton singing the Lord's Prayer. And he was singing with such fervor. Right? Um, and then when I went off to Morehouse, I, left, I went to school at 15, 16, to college. And I went to Morehouse, and Morehouse is a Baptist church. It's a Baptist school. And I heard some of the best Baptist preachers in the world. And you can hear it in my own speaking style, can't you? Um, and, but I was still angry because I'm from Mississippi. My father was really rageful. Um, you've read some of the book. He doesn't like white people very much. Um, and I had to come to terms with that, trying to understand my father's rage because I'm deathly I was deathly afraid of it. And I came across this language. I was reading Malcolm X's autobiography. And I said, there it is. And so my goatee to this day is, sac is, is, is in honor of that first conversion experience with Malcolm. So I need to be a Muslim. I'm trying to figure it out, living Malcolm's life backwards. And then I said, well, I really don't want to get married. I like drinking. <laughs> this is too strict. <laughs> so it's been a journey, a faith journey. Um, and, and part of what I, I've come to see and learn, right, is that uh, my indebtedness to, to that which has made me possible, to those who have made me possible, convict me to act in the world in such a way, in pursuit to secure goods uh, for the future generation, for, my, for myself and those to come, and to stand on that possibility, that in spite of all the brokenness that I come out of, all the brokenness, can you imagine? My godfather who introduced me to reggae music on the coast of Mississippi and I had the most brilliant smile. He, when he smiled, it was like the sun he shot himself in the heart on the day his father was put in the ground. Out of that, hey, the ground of the self-creation, brokenness, womb, and joy and love. Because my great grandma would coast the best pet cut of on the <laughs> Right? So it's not just misery, right? So there's all this joy. And so the religious, my religious journey has been all about that formation of the coast of Mississippi. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so in your um, talk, there's a kind of absence of So she's saying the absence of God talk and, and, and this idea of self-creation and, and, and self-development uh, as more powerful. I'm not really in that moment. I'm not talking about um, what is available to others. Part of what I'm trying to do in this talk is to say we need we need more descriptive categories to account for African American religion. So when we think of African American religion as just simply the preacher, the music, and the frenzy paying attention to black churches, which are typically Afro-Protestant churches. So the first thing I do is disrupt that. I'm one of the 1.2 million black Africans, right? That black religious life is actually complex. Right? You have black people who practice Baha'i, who are Buddhist, who are Muslim, who are, who are Catholic, who are Pentecostal, who are non-denominational, right? So part of what I was trying to do is disrupt the way in which um, African-American religion is generally characterized. And then there are, then there are this, strand, this strand of thinking that doesn't fall into Afro Christendom. Doesn't fall into Black Christendom. That isn't quite reducible to it. But we don't have a language to describe it. So typically people don't know what to do with Du Bois. Du Bois wrote a beautiful volume of prayers. 
uh, there's a story when he got his first job at Wilberforce, which was a seminary. They, they said, uh, now Professor Du Bois will, will say the prayer, and Du Bois said, he will not. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he has this beautiful, gorgeous book of prayers. And when you look at um, the Bedford edition of the Souls of Black Folk, you see King James Version all over the text. Um, just as you would find King James and Emerson and, and in Thoreau, right? Um, so, so at this point, what I was trying to do is kind of offer a different language, right? And it just so happens that it also characterizes me. We do know that there are large numbers of, of, of millennials, Americans, who are unchurched. Uh, we do know that American evangelicalism has flatlined. That, uh, they've now joined the ranks of mainstream uh, denominations. By the way, I'm the president of the American Academy of Religion, that's why I know all this stuff. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so mainline denominations have flatlined a long time ago, but, but uh, now we're beginning to see evangelical shrink, uh, white evangelicals in particular, they're beginning to shrink. Uh, and it's particularly having something to do with young folks. And they're, and they're, they're um, I won't I say skepticism, they're suspicion of organized faith. So you see a language of spirituality. Uh, but it's a complex story. Kind of. Yes? Could you speak a little bit more about the, the downtrend, like you're talking about, in uh, young people participating in churches, but also in black institutions in general um, starting to fall by the wayside as, as the doors are opened to, uh, to people of color to, to go to predominantly white institutions. Um, and what you do at, at Princeton as an African American Studies professor to create that kind of space within a PWI, um, and, and what those kinds of dynamics are like, and if you see anything coming to the front as a, as a new place for consciousness. To yeah. So one of the, you know, this is this is a, you know, between the world, you know, between two worlds in uh, democracy and black, right? Where I want to talk about the kind of collapse of black institutional culture. And I'm thinking about what that means in a moment, right, where we're beginning to see deepening, right, uh, evidence of the value gap, right, uh, where black life is as vulnerable, right, the headwinds of racism are strong, but the institutional mechanisms for protection, right, are collapsing. So it's not just simply um, uh, black banks, uh, black theater companies, black arts organizations, uh, we, black newspapers have died a long time ago. Uh, they're still around, but they're not, you don't have the lot to Chicago Defender and Pittsburgh Curry. If we had those newspapers now, uh, I'm not being nostalgic for it, I'm just saying if we had those newspapers, uh, the DOJ's report on Ferguson would have been dissected so much more carefully than it was, say, in the Post or the New York Times, right, or the Chicago Tribune. So, once these institutions, we see HBCUs in the 1970s and 80s, the majority of African Americans who were trained, who went to high, uh, who went to um, higher, who went to colleges and universities, attended HBCUs. Now only nine to eleven percent attend HBCUs. Yet HBCUs produce over fifty percent of the doctors, over fifty percent of the lawyers, over fifty percent of the engineers. Right? It's a real serious indictment of predominantly white institutions and what they're doing. Right? So part of what we have to think about is what, what does it mean for black people to be vulnerable, right, in this moment. Our institutions are collapsing and there's an intensification, right, of white resentment. Well, one thing I do at Princeton is to try to create spaces to think more carefully about this uh, issue uh, and to create institutional space for students uh, to, to feel comfortable. See, let me just shift gears. That's too abstract. What's so, what's so frustrating about being in this country is that we always have to convince white folks that what's happening to us is actually happening to us. No, I'm just, can we be, can we be honest? Y'all read the book, y'all know I don't get to words. You know, James Baldwin says, the reason why white America can't take seriously the grievance of black America, because to take seriously those grievances, they have to confront themselves. And we want to live in Never Never Land. We want to be the Lost Boys. 
What's distinctive about the lost boys? They don't have to be responsible. It's a perpetual state of adolescence. So one of the challenges about these spaces, these institutional spaces, is how do I exist in them? Right? How do I be? I was trained by Cornell West. Cornell told me all the time, he said, Brother Eddie, Brother Eddie, Brother Eddie, Brother Eddie. You got to wear these institutions like a loose garment. <laughs> how, do you, how do I walk in these spaces on my own terms? How do I prevent them from creating, from, from engaging in soul murder? Mm -hmm. Would you come out of these spaces broken? Because mm -hmm. you've let them get inside you and it's encapsulated them. You think somebody's doing you a thing. <coughs> Would you question your brilliance? Oh my God, my students all the time at Princeton come to my office. My students, of, and, uh, students of color come to my office all the time and they go, they're so smart. I haven't read all of them. I just, I said, that didn't make any damn sense what they said. <laughs> like, they're, they're like, they, none of them can write. <laughs> but there's something, right? And so there's a sense in which you, 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 you find yourself. We're socialized to walk softly in these spaces. I'm pimp in these spaces. <laughs> Do you let so 
somebody occupy your imaginations. Somebody who doesn't really care for you. Institutions that really don't give a damn about your dreams and aspirations. They're going to want to lock you into small corners to have you think like small people. And that's, that's for, I'm just talking just to, to students, I'm talking to all of us. We need giants to walk the earth. We need giants to walk the earth. Humbly and powerful. And let me say this to you. Outside of the number, I'm going to say this right now. I can get less than a damn if people are uncomfortable. <laughs> My energy. When I'm sitting down to talk with Joe Scarborough on, 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 on Morning Joe, I speak in the same tone I'm speaking to you. I don't have to be hyperbolic, but I tell you right now, if you think you have the right to doubt my capacity, I have the right to tell you to kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of fail. There you go. Any more questions? I'm just trying to say this because this is what we need. We need honest. We need honest talk. If we're going to break through this. If we're going to break through this, I need to give. I need to generate better language to talk about the tradition out of which I come. I mean, we need to be nuanced and sophisticated in our thinking. Or we need to be open and to build building community. But in order to build community, we have to be honest. And I cannot leave the particularity of who I am at the door as a precondition for us building community. Yeah. If that's your precondition, as Jimmy Baldwin says in Notes of the Native Son, he says, "I must wash myself blank." You know, I must make myself blank in order to wash away your guilt. I refuse that condition. If I am a gay black man, I'm going to be queer. I'm going to queer everything up in here. <laughs> if I'm committed as a feminist, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge patriarchy every turn. I'm going to step in these spaces on my terms, and I'm going to cultivate the habits of courage because otherwise I will cultivate the habits of cowardliness. It's either or in these times. There's nothing in between. Any other questions while I'm running my mouth? Last one. Right, Steve? Oh, so keep going. Yes, and then we'll come here. So it requires kind of 
discipline. A discipline. And you notice what I was doing when I was speaking? The body movement, right? It's just a musicality to it in my head, right? You know, John Coltrane would fall asleep with a horn in his mouth. Teeth, right in here, took the shape of the reed. Because he was practicing. Cordell West reads no matter how busy he is, three to five hours every day. That's it. So if we're going to build a new world, it's going to require more than just simply. It's going to require love and work. Um, yes, no, here. And then over here. I can get all the way up here. I wish I could hug all of y'all. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs>
pulpit in terms of kind of preaching and instruction. Uh, it's in that space that you know um, we're reading, read, you know, when we're reading difficult material together, modeling a certain way of, of living the life of the mind, a certain way. Of, I suppose. Um, try and fail it. Try and get it, fail it better. Um, and then there's the stuff I do. Um, when, this is part of me bearing witness. You know, uh, and it's, it's hard work. Man. Now, I mean, I don't seem like a mean guy, but you know, people threaten your lives. Threaten your life. I had a rev every they called at 6.30, no, 7.30, 9.30, 12.30, and 3.30, every hour. And they had some kind of um, computer program that would bypass the answering machine. So I couldn't sleep, because I just called. And when you didn't hang, when you answered, so the first time they were called, I'm just, you know, yo, Jack, this ain't 1963. This ain't gonna scare me. <laughs> <laughs> My hypervascular pole was red. Right. Um, then 3 30, you know, to this, to right now I can't sleep past 4 o'clock. I just think it would just wake me up. So the cause. Okay. The cause. Cornell West, I remember I was teaching at Harvard and came in and was really shook. And I said, what's going on, man? And he said, uh, uh, my wife was just was in the kitchen. And she looked out the window and there was a gun to her head. I was like, what? And see, people think these are just abstract arguments. People think they're just political games. Right? So I built community in, in the classroom and in, in, in this work of bare numbers. At least I tried to. In a loving way. Understanding, of course. Yes, and then we'll go over to you. Two more? One more. Two more, then we'll call it there. Because it's dark. I'm going to turn on the lights on this thing, in this campus. That's a good thing. <laughs> Well, 
that might be a reasonable conclusion to say that he's not decent. But but the, but the, but the point is that there, 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 there's these other moments, right? Because I think Joe, I disagree with Joe Scarborough almost on everything. Almost every position. And he knows I'm to the left of centrist liberals. He knows it, right? I just present it as if I'm not, right? Right? But I think Joe's a good guy. I just think he's wrong. <laughs> I just think he's wrong. And until he reveals to me that he's not a good guy in his deed and practice, I'll still hold him. I'll still hold him. But it's some you see what I mean? So the major work for me in that moment is not to jump to the generalization that the person is indecent. I think, I know you had one, you want to ask it, Leo? But wait, this is your the last question. Yes? Yes? You started off mentioning that you were brought up in the Catholic Church in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And toward the end here, you spoke a lot about the building community. Yes, sir. And you mentioned you were post Vatican II, and the Catholic Church did this major turnaround to say it's all about the community of the community. So, the question is for you uh, do you think that you were affected? by uh, that upbringing in, in, in the Catholic Church, and do you still have any interest in that as a part of your life, or have you moved on? Um, so, yes. <laughs> I am. St. Peter's Apostle has all been. It's all up in me. It's, <laughs> it's capillary. Um, yeah, man. It is. So, you know, they always say, you never stop being Catholic, you just lapsed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know I, and I particularly have American Catholic guilt. I wish I, I, wish I was a European Catholic, but I'm going to be very, I got that American Catholic guilt deep. I have to It's just, it cuts deep. Um, I, I love the beauty of the liturgy. I just love the beauty of the liturgy. It's just, it's, it moves me, just like I love it here. Uh, the Muslim call to prayer. I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, uh, sounds uh, on the planet. 